you know, I, I do hope that you've been enjoying each other's company and the time together. And just seeing the way everything's been decorated and the balloons and, and everything, the food. I mean, even the food looks nice. I mean, food normally, when, when you know, you give a man a plate of food, he doesn't care what it looks like. As long as it tastes good, as long as it goes down the belly, it doesn't, doesn't matter what it looks like. Okay, but even when you guys organize these things, you know, everything had to look right. Okay, and so the title that I have uh, for you today is A Lady of Beauty. A Lady of Beauty. Now, when I think about, uh, you know, the, the differences between a man and a woman, you're looking at a general man or a general woman out there, you know, something that is very different between men and women is that women, you know, I'm talking, talking just generally, are beautiful, more beautiful than men. Okay, men, you know, we're, we're built to work, we're, we're built to labor, we're not built to be delicate or pleasant to the eye necessarily. I'm not talking, talking about attraction here, I'm just saying generally speaking, a woman, just her nature, just the outward, even the inward, is more beautiful than a man. And you know what? The Lord wants you to be a lady of beauty. And so what we're going to be looking at today is what does the Lord consider beautiful for a woman? Well, first of all, you know, a woman has an eye for beauty. A woman has an eye for beauty. Okay, as I said, you guys walked in here, you know, Christina, you know, like consider the difference between organizing the ladies' high tea where Christina's spending and some of the others, you know, spending hours and hours and hours of trying to get things organized, buying the, the right tablecloths and the right runners and, you know, organizing the right food and the right balloons, all of those hours into preparing to make this thing beautiful in comparison to the men's mountain climb. Listen, we just turned up there. We just turned up. Okay, yeah, I did prepare a mini sermon, but that was it. Okay, I mean, everything else was organized right there on that same day. It didn't matter what it looked like for men. You know, it did, you know we didn't care about looking at, you know, making it look beautiful. But for ladies, you have an eye for beauty. You know, at the men's mountain climb, we had no decorations. Could you imagine if I invited the men and we, de we put the balloons for the men? We had the pink tablecloths. We had the pink flowers. You know what the men would do when they walked in? They'd say, Pastor Kevin, I think I'm going to find another church. <laughs> they wouldn't trust me anymore if I decorated a place like this for a men's gathering. Okay, So, you know, men, we're not, we're not looking for the beautiful you know, things like that, the lovely things, the decorations. This is something the ladies want. You know, we had no plates. You know, we ordered pizzas. Last minute, I asked Tim, Tim, can you find me a place? He goes, oh, I asked him, have you found a place? Oh, not really. So we ended up just buying pizzas. And we had no plates. So we used the, the, um, the pizza boxes as our plates. We ate straight out of the boxes. Did we care? Did we need the gold plates as men? No. But it's something the ladies think about, right? Like, make, what kind of plates? We'll make them golden. Make them, look, you know, make them stand out. Make sure they match the colors of the forks and all this. As men, we don't care about those things. right? So there is a clear difference between men and women you guys even organ even come in hey come in dress nicely put something on you know put something on elegant and ladies generally are like yeah that's that'll be fun that'll be something to do when the men went to the mountain climb we took off our shoes you know we were in michael's house we had no shoes so think about the odor all right i mean that place smelled like men it smelled like sweats it smelled like feet it wasn't 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 delight. I come in here, it smells great. Okay? There's a clear difference between men and women. Ladies have an eye for beauty. And so, you know, even I, I remember when we first had, you know, before Christina, before we had our first child, you know, uh, Isabel and even Nicholas, I remember going to the shops with, with Christina. She's like, oh, we need to pick out some baby clothes. We need to make sure we pick out clothes. You know, from the time we take him from the hospital to home, I want him dressed. I want her dressed a certain way. And we're going to the shops, I'm like, just, just anything will do. But for Christina, it had to be the right outfit. It had to be a beautiful outfit. It had to be something special for that child to come home. But for me, it's like, you know, men think differently, right? We think practically. As long as it gets done, that's fine. But with ladies, you like things to make, look more lovely, things to look more beautiful, for things to be more pleasant. And this is fine. God has created you to have this eye for beauty. You know, when we talk about the church, you know, I'm happy with the walls the way they are. I'm happy with the carpet the way they are. I'm happy with everything. I, I, I think this building is the most amazing thing I've ever had, you know, for a church. But you ask the average lady, she'll say, well, it needs a bit of a paint job. This needs to be touched up. We need new carpet. We need new this. Why? Because you've got an eye for pleasant, beautiful things. For men, we just want to be practical. We just, it does the job. Good. I'm happy. You know, we go from there. The next thing that I want to talk about, yes, a lady has an eye for beauty, 
But secondly, uh, if you can please, I'll get you to turn to Matthew chapter 6 if you've got a Bible. Matthew chapter 6, you turn there. We won't go there just yet. But the next thing is, as I said, just generally speaking, when you look at the difference between a man and a woman, that a woman has physical beauty about her, has physical beauty. This is something God created women to be like, okay? And you know, when Rachel was chosen uh, for Jacob, or when Jacob chose Rachel, I should say, he looked upon her beauty. It says in Genesis 29, 17, Rachel was beautiful and well-favored. And then it says in verse number 18, and Jacob loved Rachel and said, I will serve thee seven years for Rachel, thy younger daughter. You know, for Jacob, Rachel was so beautiful. He said, look, I'm going to work. I'll, I'll work seven years just to marry this beautiful woman. You know, Rachel was beautiful in the eyes of Jacob. And so, you know, just physically speaking, women are more beautiful than men. You know, if you've married a man that thinks he's more beautiful, you know, he spends more time in the mirror than, than his wife, that, that's a strange man. I, I think most men aren't doing that, right? Most men, they take a few seconds, a few minutes to, to get ready for the day, and they're not going to spend more time than their wives getting ready, okay? That's not something men generally care about for themselves, but when they're looking for a wife, hey, there's nothing wrong with looking for a woman that he finds beautiful, and one thing, especially I want to talk to the married ladies right now, the married ladies, the reason your husband married you is because he found you beautiful. That's why. He found you beautiful and he said, you know what? I'm going to marry this woman before someone else gets in the way. Before someone steps in in front of me and takes this woman as his wife, I find her so beautiful, I'm going to marry her. And I say this to the married ladies because... You know, we live in a world, we live in, in, in Satan's world, you know, the, the God of this world, and he wants you to have a different idea of your beauty, okay? Satan wants you to compare yourselves, you know, to some Hollywood actress who's 80 years old, who doesn't have a wrinkle, who looks like she's 40 when photo, photos are taken, okay? And you might look at that Hollywood actress and say, wow, she's so beautiful, she's 80 years old, she's 70 years old, how can she be so beautiful? Well, you know why? Because she has spent hundreds of thousands of dollars on plastic surgery, on liposuction, on, I don't know, Botox, on a, on a what else? What else do they, I don't know what to say, on a facelift, okay? They spend all this money, all this time. That's what they live for. They live for that beauty. And the God of this world, the devil, wants you to look at that and, and make that your measuring stick. No, don't let that be your measuring stick. Remind yourself the reason I got married is because my husband found me beautiful. Listen, ladies, please, because the world is, 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 it just wants you to feel horrible about yourself. You know, it's natural for a woman to get wrinkles. It's natural for a woman to get white hairs as she gets old. Men will get white hairs, men will get wrinkles. It, it's, it's natural for a woman's beauty to disappear as the years go by in your eyes but always remind yourself, the reason my husband married me is because he found me beautiful. Please remember that and don't compare yourself to the beauty that Hollywood produces. Because that same woman that apparently looks so beautiful, you know, when she wakes up in the morning with no makeup, she looks horrible. You know, she looks horrible. You know, she's got to spend hours and hours getting, you know, fixing herself up to make herself look presentable. But you take away the, the facelift and you take away the nose job and you take away all the plastic surgery, they're going to they're, they're look pretty bad, especially in that lifestyle that Hollywood offers. That is not the comparison. Remind yourselves, my husband married me because he found me beautiful. That's what matters. Does my husband find me beautiful? That's what matters. And he did because he married you. Okay? Don't let the devil confuse you on that. The other one the devil throws at you is the ultra-thin models. As they're walking down the, the catwalk or whatever they call it, right? And they're so thin, you can see their bones. It seems like, you know, the, the thinner you are, the, the more beautiful, so-called, they think it is. All right? But you know what? Those, those women that, you, you know, that the devil's trying to make you think are beautiful, you know what? They're constantly stressed. They're constantly worried that if they put one ounce of fat on their bodies, that they're not going to make it anymore. They're constantly worried about these issues that shouldn't be issues. You know, that after they have a meal, after they have ladies' tea, high tea, they're going to the toilet and throwing up. Okay, is that how you want to live your life? You know, comparing yourself to the beauty that the world says, hey, they're going to the toilets, they're throwing up, they don't want to put any weight on, they want to remain skinny. They're stressed about these things. 
And a woman's natural body is not to be that way. You know, the natural, you know if, if you try to, uh, to be skin and bones, you're going to mess up the hormones in your body. You're going to cause damage in yourself. You may not even be able to carry a baby, ba- baby you know, fall pregnant and carry a baby. Hey, that measure of beauty is not what God wants you to be focused on. The Lord wants you to be focused on the fact that my husband married me. Hey, that's all that matters. If I'm beautiful in the eyes of my husband, that's what matters. Who cares what the world says? Who cares what the world puts up as a standard? Because you're not there to be beautiful for the world. You are there to be beautiful for your husband. Okay? And your husband, not some other man, but your husband. He's the one that found you beautiful. You're in Matthew chapter 6, verse 27, please. Matthew chapter 6 and verse number 27. The Bible says, Which of you, by taking thought, can add one cubit unto his stature? You know, and so you can't change the way you look. You can't change your height. You can't change your skin color. You can't change your hair color. Well, I guess you can to some extent, right? If you put all those chemicals into you. You know, if God's given you curly hair, praise God for your curly hair. If he's given you straight hair, praise God for the straight hair. You know, God's created you. He found you beautiful. He, he put you together to make you look the way you look, okay? And as far as God is concerned, as long as that one man, your husband, finds you beautiful, that's all that matters. And for the ladies who are singles, who are not married yet, and especially on that table over there, you're going to be challenged by this world. This world's going to tell you, you know, you've got to look beautiful for everybody. No. All it takes is one godly man to set his eyes upon you and say, wow, what a beautiful woman. You know, and hopefully he's not just measuring that on the outward, but on the inward, the person that you are, and he'll make that decision, I'm going to marry this girl. I'm going to see, hey, I'm going to ask her out. I'm going to talk to her. I'm going to get to know her. That's all that matters. You get started there, that one man that finds you beautiful, hey, you're going to get married. You know, you don't have to worry about what this world thinks of you. God has created you the way you are. And so you need to find contentment, ladies, in the fact that your husband found you beautiful enough to marry and not seek the standards that the devil wants you to desire. Okay? So we looked at, you know, a a woman has an eye for beauty. We've looked at the physical beauty that a woman has. We're now going to be looking at the inner beauty, the inner beauty. You're in uh, Matthew. Please go to Matthew 23. Go to Matthew 23, verse 26. Matthew 23, verse 26. And, uh, you know, it it is no surprise to anybody that, as I said, generally speaking, a lady will spend more time in the mirror than a man. That's normal, okay? Generally speaking, that's fine. A woman's going to be more concerned about how she dresses than how a man dresses, okay? That's normal. But Jesus Christ gave us a warning in the Bible, not about ladies so much, but we can take the principle here and apply it to ladies. And Jesus Christ is speaking to the Pharisees here. The Pharisees, those that rejected him as as Christ, in Matthew 23, verse 26, it says, Thou blind Pharisee, cleanse first that which is within the cup and platter, that the outside of them may be clean also. What does that, you know, ladies, if you were offered a drink, you know, and and, and you, you could decide on this being, you know, this cup has to be dirty. Would you prefer the cup being dirty on the outside, but clean on the inside? or dirty on the inside, but clean on the outside, if you're going to drink from it. Obviously, if you're going to drink from it, you prefer it to be clean on the inside, because that's the substance you're going to drink from, right? Jesus makes the same point. It's more important that the clean, that it's clean on the inside than on the outside. But when it comes to the Pharisees, she's fine here, I don't mind. But when it comes to the Pharisees, they were concerned about being clean on the outside. They were clean about how they looked on the outside to the world, and they didn't care about their insides. And you know what? We take this principle here. Look at verse number 27. It says, Woe unto you, scribes and Pharisees, hypocrites, for ye are like unto whited sepulchres, which indeed appear beautiful outward, but are within full of dead men's bones and of all uncleanness. And so, ladies... You know, yes, okay, you know, spend a few minutes, whatever it is, time that you need to look in the mirror and get yourself ready. But then let that be a reminder to you when you get ready on the outside, let that be a reminder to you that I need to be ready on the inside. Jesus said it's more important that I'm clean on the inside. You know, that you, when you sin and we sin every day, that you go to the Lord and confess those sins to Him. Hey, start your day clean. Say, God, I'm sorry for my sins. Remember the what, you know, 
confess the ones you remember and confess the ones that you don't remember. Just say, Lord, there are probably others that I've not done. Please, uh, that I've done, please clean me on the inside. And so it's important that you keep that as your focus. You know, before, the reason I like to now dress with a little tie when I, can, when I get up to preach, especially behind the pulpit, is when I put the tie on, it gives me a moment to reflect, and I want to look presentable when I preach, but that gives me a moment to remember, hold on, am I right on the inside? I'm looking clean on the outside before I go to church to preach, but I have I cleaned the inside? What's the point? Do people really want to come to church and hear a preacher who might look clean on the outside but might be dirty and filthy on the inside? No, you don't want that kind of preacher. You want, you want a preacher that is at least clean. On the, it's better that I'm clean on the inside, right? You know, if, if I'm coming to church and I fall into, uh, you know, into mud or something, I get, I get dirty on the outside. It doesn't matter as long as I'm preaching God's truth and I'm clean on the inside. That's what's more important. Okay, so when you clean the outside, remember the inside. Can you please turn to 1 Peter chapter 3? 1 Peter chapter 3. Don't forget, Isabel, when we get to 20 minutes, give me a wave. All right, 1 Peter chapter 3. <clears throat> and, uh, you know, God puts a lot of emphasis on the inner man or, or the inner beauty, especially when it comes to a lady. In 1 Peter chapter 3, verse number 2, <clears throat> speaking to ladies here, it says, while they behold your chaste conversation coupled with fear. Actually, you know what? Let's drop down to verse number four for a minute. And let's look at the end of verse number four. Just the end of verse number four. It says, which is in the sight of God of great price. Now, you know what? God wants you to be someone of great price. He wants to look at all the ladies in this room and say, wow, what riches. And that's what I want to think as a pastor. You know, I think of my church, and I think of the ladies in my church. Hey, thank God that we have ladies that have, uh, 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 have great riches. You say, Pastor Kevin, are you talking about our wallets? No. Are you talking about the, the cost of our clothing? No. What does God focus on? As we saw there in verse number two, while they behold your chaste conversation coupled with fear. These are the things that are of great price. Number one, a chaste conversation or conversations like your behavior, your lifestyle. What is chaste? Something that is pure, clean, undefiled. You know, is your life clean? Is it pure? Does it, does it look like a, a godly representation in your life or does it look more like a world, the, the world, how, how the world lives? Okay? And if you can say, no, you know what, my, my life reflects godliness. My, my life reflects Jesus Christ, my Savior. Then you can say, wow, my life is of great price. But what else? It says coupled with fear. So yes, you know, being godly, being clean, being pure, but coupling that with the fear of God. You know, having a fear of God will help you live right. Okay? And you know, when it comes to my children, you know, they love mom and dad, but they've got a fear of the rod. Okay, they've got a fear, if we step out of line, I'm going to cop that. And so that, as a reminder, in the back of their minds, the fear of the rod, fear of you know, mum and dad's chastisement will you know, cause them, to, when they have the temptation to do something wrong, to say, wow, am I going to risk getting the rod? You know, am I going to risk getting away with it and get the rod? You know, or am I, you know, well, I'm not. You know, I could really cop it this time for my parents, right? It's the fear that will cause it to stop for a moment and say, well, is what I'm doing right? Is it, you know, will, will God be pleased or is it just sinful and will it please myself? And so when you couple it with the fear of God, it will help you live that clean, pure, undefiled life. Look at verse number three. Who's adorning, let it not be that outward adorning of plating of hair and of wearing of gold, or putting on of apparel. So, you know, you probably all have done this, and that's not, it's not saying this is wrong, okay? But that's not what is of great price to God, okay? Verse number four, But let it be the hidden man of the heart, in that which is not corruptible, okay? Even the ornament of a meek and quiet spirit, which is in the sight of God of great price. A meek and and quiet spirit. What does it mean to be meek? To be meek is the idea of being mild, you know? When it comes to your, uh, you know, uh, you know you, I guess you don't lose your temper easily, you know? Uh, it means to not be easily provoked. It means that you're, you're gentle. It means that you're submissive to God's will. Hey, God wants me to live in accordance with this. I'm going to submit myself. I'm going to be meek enough to say, yes, God, I'm going to live after the way you want me to live. And then when it says quiet spirit there, 
Don't misunderstand that. That's not saying that ladies are not allowed to speak. Okay, that ladies are not allowed to have an opinion. That's not what it's saying. You know, have you ever had heard the term, you know, she lives a quiet life? Speaking about someone. What are they saying about that person? They're saying that person that lives that quiet life, she's content, she's at peace. Okay, she's not troubled, she's not fighting, she's not finding contention, she lives a quiet life. So quiet is the state of being, the state of rest, being at peace, being content, being satisfied. Okay, ladies, if you have that meek and quiet spirit, God says that you are of great price to him. You're valuable. You know, you're rich. Okay? Uh, you know, people in, uh, in this world, they seek the big bank accounts. They seek the things that are red. They, they think of things that are, are valuable. When they think of a car, it's, it's got to be a, a BMW or, you know, it's, it's got to have a brand or the clothing, it's got to be. I don't know, what, what, what clothing brands do ladies wear? What's that, sorry? Gucci. It's got to be the Gucci bag. It's got to be the... I don't know. I don't know. <laughs> sorry. I'm sorry. You know, obviously, I don't buy fancy clothes for my wife, okay? So I don't know the brands. But you know, those things are, are not what God finds as great price. That's what the world is after. But hey, your inner man, that, that which is incorruptible, that which is saved, born again, that which is following after, after the Lord, living after his ways, that's what God considers of great price. You know what? I would love nothing more for God to look down at New Life Baptist Church and say, wow, how rich. How rich is that church? And he's looking, of course, at the inner man, especially there of the ladies, in the sight of God of great price. Now, the next thing I want you to look at, if you can please turn to 1 Timothy in your Bible. 1 Timothy chapter 5. We're almost done. We're up to the last point now. So the three points so far was that ladies have an eye for beauty. Number two, that ladies uh, have a physical beauty. Number three, there is also an inner beauty that you need to consider. In fact, that's the most important part, okay? And then, finally, that ladies, you have a beautiful role. Okay, I just got the wave, that's 20 minutes. You have a beautiful role that God has asked you to live by, okay? A beautiful role. Now, in Genesis chapter 2, verse 18, it says, And the Lord God said, It is not good that the man should be alone, but I will make him and help meet for him. Ladies, why were you created by God? You were created to help a man, to help a man. You say, how degrading, how degrading. That's what the world wants you to think, how degrading. But the reverse is also true, that it's not good for a man to be alone. A man needs a wife. A man needs a wife. The reason, uh, ladies, you were created is so God can have the institution of marriage they can have an institution of a family and that children can be born from that union. It's not degrading, it's complementary. Okay? Your function is to be a support, a help, you know, to your husbands. And for the single girls, that's what God has created you to be. To find that right man who will love you, okay, and say and you, you know, that you will help that man be something that he can be. You know, I could not be a, be a pastor if not for my wife. You know, I, I, could, I would not have great kids. And I think they're great. I don't know what you think. but I think they're great. I could not have great kids if not for my wife. I, I couldn't do it on my own. Okay? It's not good for a man to be alone. A man cannot achieve as much in his life without a good helping wife. You know, I would not have the desire to work and provide if not for the desire of having a wife and family. You know, I would not be living a happy life if not for my wife, okay? These things are complementary husbands and wives. Ladies, you have a beautiful role. You know, the world does not want you to think like this. The world wants you to think you're wasting your life if you have a desire to get married, if you have a desire to help your husband. The Bible also says in Psalm 113 verse 9, He maketh the barren woman to keep house and to be a joyful mother of children, Praise ye the Lord. Hey, ladies, I want you to be joyful. I want you to live a life of joy. How do I live a life of joy? Well, you do what the Lord has asked you to do. Keep your house, be the housekeeper, and, and be a joyful mother of children. Children. The Bible also says, you're in 1 Timothy chapter 5, verse 14. Let's look at it quickly. 1 Timothy chapter 5, verse 14. I will, therefore, that the younger women marry, bear children, guide the house, 
give none occasion to the adversary, the adversary is the devil there, to speak reproachfully. You know what? If the devil sees a lady in her role, in her beautiful role that God created, the devil cannot attack your family. You know, if the lady is stepping outside of her role, if she hates her role, if she's not living after the role, the devil will come in and, and hurt your family. It will cause fights in your, in your marriages. It will cause children to lose respect for their parents. The devil will try to find a foothold in your family to destroy it. But you know what? God has given you a beautiful role to, to compliment a man. A man compl compliments a woman. The woman compliments the man. And the reason I want to end on this point is because, once again, the God of this world will try to make you believe that this is an unpleasant, uh, you know, uh, miserable life. Oh, you're a housewife. Oh, you've got a bunch of kids. You know, the, the world will try to make you think uh, low of yourself. But remind yourself, the person you're trying to please is your husband and ultimately please the Lord God. He's the one that matters. He's the one that, that you know, is holding you accountable for the life, for the family that is put into your hands. You know, I've worked with many ladies in my life. I, I, I managed a call center, and most of that call center, I would say like 95% of that call center were ladies. And many of those ladies were mothers, were, 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 were uh, uh, wives and mothers. And uh, many, when you talk to them, many of them, you know, thought that living a life for some career being a career-minded woman was what life was all about. They spent thousands, you know, they're, they're thousands of dollars in, in, in debt to some university, right? They're, they're in thousands of dollars in debt to some education system. And, and they feel like, well, I've invested so much of my time, so much of my money for an education, for a career. They feel, well, I just got to live this career out. But when you talk to them, they're miserable. They're unhappy. I'm, 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 look, I, I managed. So obviously, when things weren't going well, sometimes these ladies would come and talk to me and, and tell me why they couldn't you know, uh, uh, function in the job properly, why they were having problems. All the times it revolved around family, all the time. You know, when, when you summarize that, I wish I was at home with my kids. I wish I could go and pick them up from school. I wish I could drop them off or whatever. I wish I didn't miss all these years of seeing them grow up. I wish I could be there with my husband. My husband needs me. And, and so they've got all these thoughts just in their natural DNA, even though they've been taught to live like the world, even though they've been taught it's a miserable life, you know, just in their DNA, in their general makeup, they desire to be at home with their family. And you know this is true because, you know, when there's a little baby in church, you know who gravitates to that, toward that little baby? It's the little girls, okay? The little, the boys, younger boys just walk past. They don't care about, you know, the baby. But it's, it's the little girls that will come toward the baby and they've got that motherly instinct. Listen, little children, are, uh, uh, what, what are they looking for? Are they looking to work or are they looking for pleasure? Are they looking to have fun and games or are they looking to labor hard and be miserable? Little children are looking for fun. They're looking for something pleasant, something they enjoy. And so when little girls you know, naturally, you know, a desire to hold a baby and to play with a little baby, they find that fun because in, inside of them, you know, God has put, hey, this is a fun life. This is a joyful life, raising children. And then as they grow up in their education system, the world tells them, actually, that's a miserable life. That's not fun. But yet, inside of them, they knew that would be a great life, you know, raising a family. And so, ladies, the last point that I have for you here is you've got a beautiful role. Don't let the world brainwash you. Don't let anyone else brainwash you to make you think that being a godly mother, a godly wife, is something that is not of great price. We, we can see from the Bible what God considers valuable, what He considers rich and rare. A woman, yes, a woman has an eye for beauty. Yes, women are uh, you know, nat more nat you know, naturally more beautiful than a man. Yes, even though that's, that's good, more important than that is the beauty of the inner man, okay? And finally, you've got a beautiful role. You live that beautiful role, I promise you, you're going to have a happy life. You're going to enjoy that life if you switch off the God of this world and pay attention to what God wants from you. You're going to be able to live that, that, that quiet life. You're going to have that peace. You're going to have that joy as you serve the Lord and your family. Okay, let's pray.